youth, researchers, educators, and local governmental, wait no, local government representatives about the importance of bees in celebration of an, exi an exciting time for friends of pollinators in the Cowichan Valley. Bees and other pollinators play an essential role in every aspect of the ecosystem. They support the growth of trees, flowers, and other plants, which serve as food and shelter for a diversity of creatures. Bees contribute to complex interconnected ecosystems that cradle all forms of life and allow a number of different species to coexist. But our pollinators are currently threatened by pesticide use, habitat destruction, and climate change. So now let's introduce our panelists and from them learn a little bit more about bees. First up is Magali Shimali, CEO of the Canadian organization Bee Watch and longtime bee lover and researcher. Next, we have Nicole LaRusso, a teacher at Queen Margaret School who has been supporting the QMS Eco Club in getting QMS committed to and recognized as a bee school. Following is Hannah Orr, coordinator of the Cowichan Green Community Residency Project to support pollinators habitat restoration in our community. Then we have Katia Bannister, a member of the QMS Eco Club and the Couch and Valley Earth Guardians crew, two youth groups work, doing work to protect pollinators in the Couch and Valley. And finally, Michelle Staples, mayor of the city of Duncan and ally to the bees. We'd like to begin now by asking our opening question, which all our panelists will have a chance to answer. So we're looking to find out how your work relates to bees and how you engage and support young people through that work. Um, anyone who uh, would like to speak to that can go ahead and speak. Do you guys want me to start? I don't mind starting. Sure. And lead it off. Uh, so my work with bees as a, a teacher started with creating learning opportunities for students to understand the biology and ecology of pollinators. And that really quickly evolved to finding out ways to support students' interest in taking action to help the bees. I quickly discovered that many students seem to have a great affinity to bees. And the earliest work we did was through action projects in biology class where I had a bunch of students who wanted to change the laws around pesticides to help bees. Uh, through the years, projects have added mason bee houses and more habitat to our campus. And we're in our second year of working with the University of Guelph Citizen Science Project where we install nesting tubes and send them away to be used as data in a cross Canada pollinator study. Uh, more recently, a group of students in our eco club were brainstorming ideas for a project to tackle uh, when they came across the idea of a B city B school certification. I encouraged them to take on the challenge as it gave them a focus and required clear action. So they had to form a pollinator team. They had to develop pollinator habitat action plan. They had to promote education about pollinators and they had to celebrate pollinators. Before they could fully realize their plan, COVID sent us all into remote learning. Uh, however, this spring, the awesome members of our Eco Club and Duncan Youth Council, so Naomi, Maya, and Katya, they picked up where the others had left off and took it way further than I had ever expected. And my job as their teacher was to provide an environment for them to generate ideas, gently guide them when needed, uh, and do what I could to support them and help lift them up as leaders and change makers. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some stuff later on. So I'll leave it at there and pass it on to the next person. Thank you so much. Does anyone would like to go out after Miss Lisa? I'd be happy to. Um, awesome. Awesome. So my work as a youth and as a community organizer and steward in the Cowichan Valley, Valley is multifaceted for sure. But in the past year, I've had a lot of opportunities to take these tangible actions and coordinate community work related to protecting pollinators and their habitat. And as a youth, engaging and lifting up the voices of young people is particularly important to me. So I make sure to use my place in the Cowichan Valley community as an organizer to create these opportunities to contribute to our social, cultural, ecological communities and make opportunities to do this accessible and interesting to young people like myself. And as a young person myself, I often know what strikes a chord in taking on this community work with youth. So I'm at an advantage when it comes to youth engagement, but it's not simply just about engaging youth because that's, that's not enough. We also need to be facilitating these intergenerational relationships in the work that we do. And in doing so, we need to facilitate the transference of intergenerational knowledge and values to create a more vibrant and a, a more community-minded future for the places in which we live. 
Thank you so much. Um, anyone would like to go after that? <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll, yeah, I'll follow that. Um, particularly because um, Katya and I recently co-hosted a um, pollinator planting in Kin Park in the city of Duncan. And it was just such a, such a lovely um, work bee. And we did really have that intergenerational space. Um, and we had a few of the elders who work with me in the resiliency project and then a group of earth guardians. And um, yeah, it is, it is, there is something really special to um, work together as a community um, and have those spaces where, you know, there are the, you know, those relationships being established and sharing of knowledge and, and inspiration too, you know, um, and then also be working together to, to uh, have a positive ecological impact. Um, and so my work um, in the resiliency project at the Couch and Green community, I'm focused on creating a network of pollinator meadows in community green spaces. Um, and then also encouraging people to re-examine their own landscaping practices and, and to really see each one of our own, you know, suburban yards or whatever, whatever space we inhabit, to really see that space as, as a area for potential for, for ecological um, transformation and to really deepen our relationships with the pollinators and the insects and just the rest of the food web. So um, yeah, that's sort of where I come from. Uh, like the angle that I come from. And then also as a mother um, of two young kids and, uh, you know, and facing the realities that we're facing in climate collapse and biodiversity loss, um, I feel like there is a real need for um, the type of community activities where we're engaging in a positive way in a meaningful, tangible way in habitat restoration. Um, but also having those deeper conversations about, you know, like what does extinction mean to us as a people? Um, and like, how can we engage with this in a way where we can sort of start to, um, start to move through some of the overwhelm that I really feel like people are facing while we tackle these giant issues. To me, habitat restoration with the focus of, of supporting pollinator health is one of the most inspiring ways that people on the ground can have a positive impact um, ecologically and, and do it together. And, and it's just a really beautiful, fun activity. So yeah, thanks. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Magali or Michelle, if you'd like to- Yeah, I can, I can, I, yeah, I can, I awesome. can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I just want to warn you, it's my birds are in the background and I don't know what's happening, but they're very agitated. So you may hear like I'm in a tropical forest, but no, those are just two budgies. <laughs> okay, so I'm very excited to share a little bit of my passion today with you. So uh, what do I do? Uh, I mean, how my work relate to bees? Well, everything in my work relate to bees, <laughs> basically. So. Um, I build bee project with schools and they're centered around observation hives. So I have here a little a tiny model um, that I use um, usually to show people how it looks like. Um, so an observation hive, so that's an indoor hot beehive for honeybees um, that look like this. So people at QMS know exactly because you guys have an actual one. Um, so it's made out of wood and two panels of glass. So the students can watch what's happening inside the hive. Um, and the bees are connected to the outside through that tube that goes either through a wall or through a window. So yeah, that's an observation hive. And um, so observation hive are, are a great way to engage students um, because they can open, take off the cover and watch the bees anytime, all throughout the year, without having to put a bee suit on, without having to uh, open a hive and disturb the colony. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very easy actually to get engaged. Um, also the thing with observation hive is it, um, it helps bring, uh, make education come alive. So uh, what I like to say is that an observation hive is like a living classroom because basically what you can, 
you can immediately relate what you learn in a classroom to what you see in a hive. Um, so that's the, and that's a very easy way to engage, get the student engaged when you have this tool available. And also another way that students get engaged into, you know, with bees is, is more emotional um, because we've, we've seen that very quickly the students um, build a bond, a connection to the bees. And uh, just because the bees are there, they're part of their life. And, uh, and then when there is that bond, they care about the bees. And then so they care about their struggles, about their happiness, about their needs. And in life, when you start caring about something, it, you know, great things happen uh, in many different directions, but always great things. So caring is really central. Um, yeah, and to answer the last part of your question, um, which was uh, how we support youth through that learning experience, I would say we, we offer in some schools classes about the honeybee, the biology of the honeybees, um, we organize remote maintenance of the hive, as it is the case at Queen Margaret's Hive, uh, and we just answer questions that the students may have, may have about their colony or their bees. Yes. Okay, thank you, Michelle. I guess that leaves me. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Uh, in terms of being involved with bees, I, I, I mean, just from the city's perspective, one of the things that um, Ms. LaRusso was talking about was a presentation a number of years ago that a group of stu students um, came to the Environment Committee. I don't even remember how many years ago it was, Ms. LaRusso, but it's been a while. And at the time I was the chair of that committee and the committee really listened to what the students said and, and um, the city worked at, at changing the way that, that we take care of, uh, of, of weeds and not using pesticides and, and changed policy at the city level to support uh, what the youth presentation had brought to us. And so that was, again, I think it was at least seven or eight years ago. And so the other way is that before COVID, we used to have a, a Duncan Junior Youth Council and it, it did, the, the youth did some extremely amazing things. And this term, one of the, the things that a former youth council member, who's now a, a council member, um, Councillor Jenny Capps, and, and I were both really passionate about, and also Councillor Newington was resurrecting um, the Duncan Youth Council and looking at what kind of form that could take. And so just before COVID, we had finally got together uh, to sit down with the students. It was in February, I still remember. And it was a very rainy day like today and um, coming to the school and having a, a, a conversation about, about ideas. And one of the ideas was about bees. Bees and trees actually were the things that we were talking about. And then within a few weeks, uh, our world changed and completely shut down. And the conversations, they, they weren't going back and forth in the same way that they had started, but the school, continued that conversation and other things happened. So the project that Hannah was talking about that took place in the parks, um, McAdam Park has a, a ton of areas now that have different habitat that have been um, brought together, the community brought together to plant pollinators. And there's been more discussion, the program that, um, or the project that Couch and Valley Open Learning is doing. And so there's been all these things kind of happening over this last year and a half. People have become way more engaged with their their, their yards again in a different way, with their parks again in a different way. And so it sort of seems fitting that all of that is leading to, um, to, to this ask of the city when QMS students came and presented and asked the city to, to consider becoming a bee city. And for the things that, uh, the things that the city has talked about wanting to do within our small area, we're only one square mile but you can make a lot of changes in that square mile. And, and so I, I feel like that's one of the exciting parts of this to me is how we get to do that together and how this is really being led and driven by young people. I think that you know we're here to support young people in all the ways that we can. And as the example with, um, with now Councillor Capps, you know, there, there, there are many young people from that junior council who are doing incredible work in the community in different ways. And I really believe that engaging people and, and having you lead us and you mentor us 
and and you know and having this this recip reciprocity happening between us is is really what can change things um, at a deep and meaningful level and in deep and meaningful ways in our community. And I feel like that is what this has the potential of doing. It's a conversation um, starter because youth bring this kind of vibrance and excitement to, to these types of things. And you remind all of us why these things can matter and also how easy it is for us to make small changes, to make a huge difference. And in this case, to make a huge difference, to invite more bees to be a part of our city and and how you know all the pollinator gardens around the certain distance from the hives how those actually it connect our community together as well and that's one of the things that i'm really looking forward with is building those types of relationships and 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 i'm really excited to see where this is going and our application went in last friday to become the first bee city on vancouver island so uh, it was unanimously supported at council and we're very excited. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now we'll be asking individual questions, starting with Magali. Uh, some research supports the idea that the honeybees are competing with native bee species for resources like nectar and pollen. Will promoting the honeybees hurt the native bees? Yes, so um, yeah, so just a little reminder about the situation. The, the honeybees are bee species, so they belong to the huge family of bees that includes 20,000 species. And, uh, uh, and the honeybees uh, is not a native from North America. It was brought in, to, in North America by the first colons that came uh, from Europe. And they brought the bees, the honeybee, with uh, them uh, to pollinate their crop. So they needed them. They needed the honeybee. And so you, you will hear a lot in the literature, in the news, you know, a lot of people talk about honeybees versus native bees. Um, and so with um, the development of backyard beekeeping, which is basically uh, hobbyist beekeeper people just wanted to have a beehive in their garden because they're interested they love bees or because they want the honey uh, with this the development of this in the cities uh, one question was raised which was you know do are we going to face a limitation with resource are we going to have enough food for everybody enough food for the honeybees and for the native bees because native bees play an amazing role for the ecosystems. We have to support them. And, you know, like having so many honeybees, yes, we were a little scared. Maybe that's too many bees and the native bees will suffer. And um, apparently that's what the research showed is like in some places, sometime you can have a limitation of resource. Um, so what the few scientists said is like, okay, they named the culprit, which is, the honeybee and then they thought about a potential solution which is limit limitation limit limiting the number of beehives in the cities um so now what i think uh, of that is like maybe we don't have the good culprit the right culprit and maybe we have other solutions because instead of saying oh uh, in the cities we do not have enough food for everybody, so we need to get rid of the honeybee. We can say we don't have enough food, so we need to have more green space. And then we have to design the cities differently. And, um, and so, yes, because when you have more green space, not only you have more food, more flowers for all the bees, but you also have more habitat for native bees, because that's really what they need the most, habitat uh, that we are not respecting. So, and then you have more trees, so more birds, more oxygen more beauty more all of what we all need um so yeah that's really the thing so you, you're going to hear a lot about that research and um that can be frustrating that as a solution they just want to get rid of the honeybee while there is obviously something that will have more positive impact than that awesome thank you so much uh working on creating more habitat for bees is so important so 
great that you talked about that. Um, you earlier mentioned how observation hives can engage youth well, which as a student at QMS, I can definitely confirm that seeing as we have one of those. So on that note of B projects within schools, what are the changes that you can see in students after you start a B project in their school? All right, so um, one thing that that is very obvious is like an increase in knowledge. <laughs> Students because become more knowledgeable. Um, so a lot of things that they really never noticed about bees and, and where they are, what flower. Oh, there's some flower where that they like, some they don't like. All those things, all of a sudden, they start knowing. So you see they have more knowledge globally. So that's very obvious. Um, one thing too is more curiosity and more interest because um, having a hive on campus in the middle of your school, you know, drags in a lot of students who never thought they could be interested in these. And that's the whole point is not to just, you know, some kids will naturally go toward that, those things, those information, the science, the, the ecosystem, but some kids might be interested if you bring it to them. So that's the idea. So you see globally an increase you know, of interest generally and curiosity in most of the students. Um, one thing is you see less fear and that's pretty obvious. A lot of students are very scared about being stung by bees um, when, you know, at the beginning of the project when we install the bees and a lot of kids are like, I don't even know if I'm allergic and, and some are allergic. Um, so with time, they actually see that, you know, Nobody gets stung, or maybe one or two students every year. Um, you know, it's not it's not a big deal, and so fear decreases. That's pretty obvious. Uh, so fear of getting stung um, in elementary schools. I see a lot of um, uh, like the, the decrease of fear of death um, because uh, that's something I never I never really suspected, but having dead bees, you know, some dead bees on the floor and the little kids would be like, well, oh, it is dead and sad and why? And it was sick. And so it's, you know, it's about explaining that death sometimes is part of life. And, you know, those bees will die and new bees will come and it's just a cycle. And, um, and yeah, after a couple months, uh, you see the kids are very relaxed seeing a dead bee and they're like, yeah, another one is gonna come. <laughs> and then you don't have that fear. So that's also very obvious. Um, and then, you know, generally talking, I think the student realized that the bees are fascinating and, uh, and that we can live together. Um, that's something else. I think we grew up a lot in this mindset that we have our cities, our home, and nature is outside. And, and this, the, this project really showed them that we can actually live together. Uh, the bees have their job, we have our job. And, everybody's happy. There is um, no problem with that. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Magali. Um, we're now going to move on to Ms. LaRusso. And your question is, why is it important for you to find ways to take learning out of the classroom and into the community? Ah, great question. Thank you, Maya. <laughs> um, the yeah, so for me, it's always been a priority to try to um, get learning, move learning beyond the walls of the classroom. And I think there are many reasons, but two that really um, are highlighted to me are one of creating authentic learning experiences. Um, and then the second one, which I think Hannah kind of spoke to is as an antidote for climate or environmental despair. And so I'll just speak a little bit to both of those. So authentic learning experiences, I think, um, ones that speak to the heart and the mind, they provide opportunities for students to get in the community and engage with members of community. So, um, and then they have teachers all around them that they can connect with and grow relationships with and connect to for uh, in hopes for future work. Uh, some, like for an example that, I talked about briefly and then Michelle touched on a little bit is that this group that I had in uh, that wanted to ban pesticides it started out as a biology class project where I challenged students to take action on something that related to what we had been studying in class and so a couple students got super excited about bees and um, the struggles that they faced and they wanted to uh, create 
change in our community. And so I think at the time, um, Michelle and I had been working together actually on another project uh, previous to that, which was uh, getting students to have a, a student led composting project, which I don't know, Michelle, if at the time you were a city councilor or you were working for the city or you're working with social planning Cowichan, or I don't even know how we connected. School district. <laughs> School district. That's regional, sorry, regional district. Regional district. So um, we connected on another project. I think that I, I had gone to Michelle and said, I have these students. I think that that's how it came to be that want to, to create change. And I think we actually started by presenting to the Duncan Youth Council and then asked them or urged them to take it forward and bring it to, um, to the environment committee. And uh, beyond that, they also wanted to like do something in our school to create change. And so they planted pollinator friendly plants and then wanted to spread awareness around our school community. And uh, it continued to grow because then they linked up with another group who wanted to um, deal with food security, who had before the time of the refresh store that we have here and that's trying to divert food waste, um, they had gone to the grocery stores and they had gone to um, the local food bank and said, what can we do? How can we reduce waste? And what they ended up doing was getting a local company to donate wood and another company to donate soil and they built some garden beds and they grew food in those garden beds and grew pollinator attractant plants and so they got just super excited and passionate and really started to care about these issues and it just grew into things that were so much more than i expected they could be and um that's kind of led to now what the students who are hosting here and katya the work that they've done of trying to learn about bees where they've had to become be experts and have led scavenger hunts through every, I think every single member of our school has participated in educational scavenger hunts and have had lessons taught to them. Uh, they painted the school greenhouse and the theme of pollinators and they're leading the webinar this evening. This is authentic learning. And I think that that is something I'm always trying to expand for my students. And then the other one is the antidote for climate despair. It's there's a lot of doom and gloom and as a science teacher it's really hard to not get stuck in that doom and gloom and as someone who wants to have help students to see that yes there are challenges and we need to understand the science of these challenges but also that there is hope and we can create change uh, these action projects are a way that we can contribute to that change and so and and in students, they can really develop that understanding that hope is possible. Um, and through that, we've done all sorts of projects, including our, we planted plants for Hannah and created our own little native plant nursery. And um, we have challenged the Duncan City Council and it's so exciting and like fills us so much with hope to see that the council unanimous, unanimously has decided to move forward on trying to become a B certified city. And so all of this stuff um, creates hope. I'm just gonna give a little shout out to Katya and then um, I'll stop talking, but also oh, I've had my students work on climate change projects and Katya just went, did one in my class where she had to develop a policy to try to Im reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And I think she chatted with Hannah a little bit about that policy and talked about her previous work she did. And she, I convinced, well, I didn't take much convincing, but I suggested she entered in a national contest and she just won first place. So that's authentic learning, but it's also hope inspiring learning. And so that's kind of always my goal. Awesome, thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Katya. That's fantastic. Um, also, I just see in the chat uh, that there, that we have a question. And I believe at the end, we will be looking through some questions and giving the panelists the opportunity to speak to those. Uh, so rest assured that your questions will be addressed. Uh, but for now, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. LaRusso her second question. So uh, what do you identify as the teacher's role in connecting youth with the bees and other environmental projects? So my role, I think, is the facilitator and a support. Uh, my goal is to help students to realize their agency. So not only their capacity to affect change, but also to be able to drive that change. Uh, I'm, I think I'm so lucky to be a teacher. I think I have the best job in the world because I get to work with young people every day and you young people are brilliant um, and your ideas often blow me away. Um, 
So like our amazing uh, youth representatives we have on our panel today and our hosts, um, I, my job is to, uh, they're always ready to run with ideas. My job is to help them to make that happen. Uh, we, for example, the case of becoming a B school, we looked at the opportunity. Maybe I pushed it on them a little bit. <laughs> I think Michelle helped to push it a little bit. Uh, but then we, I gave them the opportunity to uh, take the driver's seat. Uh, other students might need a little bit more support to get where they want to be. Um, and so I might need to give a little bit more direction or guidance. But I think that um, one of the ch most challenging parts as a teacher is to try to step back and let students take the lead. And so I really try to do that. I try to provide support when they need it and give a little gentle guidance or connect them with the resources if I know something that I think might help them out. But I think it's really important to help students to see that they can take ownership of the projects that they have and help them realize that they are capable of taking the lead and they know that I'm there to help them if they need it. Definitely, thank you. Uh, we'll be moving on to Katia. So Katia, how can youth take roles in community-based initiatives, particularly pertaining to protecting pollinators? Thank you, Maya, and thank you to Ms. LaRusso for the shout out for my little win there. Um, to answer the question, uh, you've surely heard it before, but I will say it again because it's worth hearing. Youth are the future. Um, to ensure that the work being done to protect pollinators now has that longevity that we need it to have, engaging youth is key. They're going to carry this stuff forward. And you know what? So many youth are actually thrilled when they receive an invite into doing the work, as long as they have people to support them in doing so. And Ms. LaRusso touched on that. Creating opportunity for youth to present to local council on the subject of something they care about, whether that be bees or, or trees or or fleas, I don't know, um, could, could be daunting. But um, with other community members to show them those steps to get the issues they care about talked about and then acted upon, youth will mobilize. Youth will show up to plant trees and pollinator plants. They will show up to do community cleanups. They will show up to protest. They will show up to advocacy events. Youth love to show up and do the work. They love the tangible, those things that you can really sink your teeth into, dig your hands into. And so what we need to do is to know that and embody that and invite them into those roles. Let their voices and their passions shine in the work that we ask them to do. Thank you so much, Katia. Uh, your second question is um, how have local youth in our community been engaged in pollinator protection? Okay, so uh, I think just in the last year, we've had like a really big surge of uh, pollinators being a key theme for youth in our in our wonderful valley and youth in the couch and valley have tackled some amazing projects to protect and celebrate pollinators so uh, last year my organizing group the couch and valley earth guardians crew we have a few members on the call tonight um, we had made plans to host a world bee day event in may with pollinator mural planting and music and pollinator themed games and a raffle, uh, native pollinator plant seed swap. And then those plants kind of initially fell apart because of COVID. Uh, but later last summer, um, work on that pollinator mural co commenced with um, compliance with current COVID-19 protocols and local youth spearheaded the painting of a mural featuring two bees and a multitude of pollinator plants uh, in Kim Park in Duncan. And actually recently, um, youth have been actively involved in the Rizonzi project, which Hannah coordinates. And we've been doing invasive species removal. We've been planting pollinator plants to create pollinator meadows. Uh, for local bees and other uh, pollinating insects. And we recently created one of those meadows underneath the mural that we painted last summer, which was just 
such a special moment for me to see something that had been a long time in the making um, come to fruition and then to see these layers building on top of it. Um, and a final example of what you, uh, local youth have been uh, doing and being engaged in pollinator protection um, has already been touched on by Ms. LaRusso and by Michelle and by Hannah too, I think. Uh, but the youth on this webinar have been playing a huge role in getting Queen Margaret School declared a B school and pushing the city of Duncan to be declared the first B city on Vancouver Island. So we've filled out formal documents, we've educated our fellow students, hosted fun pollinator centers centric activities at our school, uh, pl planted a pollinator garden at QMS and created and presented a presentation uh, to the Duncan City Council to like put all this in motion. And it is in motion and moving fast with passion and momentum. And that really at the heart of it is because of the power of our voices as dedicated youth. And I'm so grateful to live in a community where our voices are supported. Great, thank you. Um, on the note of all that great B City stuff and the Duncan Council, our next questions are going to be to Michelle. So Michelle, uh, looking back in 10 years time, where do you hope that the city and community will be with respect to bee conservation and habitat protection? Well, what I'd like to see in 10 years from now is all the, the plantings that the city does that change every year. And this is something that has been has come up at um, at city council already. And the city has been making a lot of headway already over the past few years at, at really changing to, to pollinators and to indigenous species in our plantings. And so I'd like to see that continue to grow until we've completely switched over. And the other thing that I'd like to see is the boulevards that we all have. So there's boulevards all throughout the city. And I feel like it would be a phenomenal achievement if we grew pollinators and food in all of the boulevards and, and encouraged that got the community excited enough that they wanted to do that, you know, have have perennial um, pollinators on every street in, in the boulevards and and work with people to be excited about making it part of, of their their yards of their plantings um, not just in their boulevards but also in their in their backyards is that that people have enough awareness around it that we've got to a place where it's just what we do um, as a city as a community it's sort of part of who we are where you know they have they have these part of the bee city is that you you can get like different little bees and stuff in your yard right little little sticks and different things that show that that this is important to you and I feel like if we can get there then we've reached um we've reached protection we've reached understanding you know we we've, we've reached that place where where if if there's if that's just the way that people um do things that's the that's just the first you don't even think about it that's just what you do then we're there already so that's what I would like to see and the same thing, you know, I think just continuing to grow what's already started being started in the parks and, and started by the city and, and enhanced by um, Hannah and the working groups. And we have two other schools in, in Duncan, so it would be great to have them become B schools as well. And really just show leadership that in a small urban area, you can actually create an incredibly um, healthy in, an environment where bees can thrive. I think that that would be a, a pretty amazing thing to look back at in 10 years. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Um, your second question is, Queen Margaret's work with bees aligned with their Duncan Youth Council project. Could you tell us more about what the Duncan Youth Council is and like the visions you and other members of the city council have for the youth council? So the vision that we have for the youth council is actually that, that that gets developed by youth, what that actually is going to look like. So there isn't an official youth council yet because we got interrupted by COVID. So this year we've been, you know, starting to build those pieces, working with youth from CVALC and from, um, from QMS to, you know, start to become those members of council. But there hasn't been the time or the space for youth to really envision what that council will look like. 
And so I don't actually want to say what it looks like from my perspective, because I really want that to be guided by youth themselves. And I think for me, the biggest thing is, is the engagement piece that Katja just spoke about, right? That how, how can we make sure that youth are connected to the things that are happening in the city and helping guide, you know, what we're working on and, and what's important to us and helping us define that. I think that that's a huge piece. Um, we're going through an official community plan process and, and part of, we, we, we held off for, you know, for, for enough time as it took for us to get a youth member on that that committee and that has never happened before because we it's really important to everyone at the city and council that that youth voices are part of all the conversations that we're having because we we need to do this that intergenerational piece we need to have that voice and so what that council becomes that's really going to be a vision you know that I look forward to exploring starting in the fall when we can come back together again and really look at yeah what that what that looks like to all of you but I know that it's really just about having all of you um, work with us uh, work beside us you know get dirty in the in the mud together we've done that before <laughs> just um, speak up you know I think of some of the things that the youth council did before there was a huge huge um, conference here and it was all about youth um, in and there was no youth presenters at the or youth voices at the conference. And when we found that out, we asked if the youth council could come and speak and, and could do a presentation. And they engaged 300. Um, there was RCMP officers there. There was people from the prison system, from the judicial system, from all over the place, 300 people. And they engaged and led them through the processes and the way that youth wanted to be engaged. And it really challenged them all, but it also really helped people uh, understand and, and kind of connect with the, you know, we've all been young people, uh, connect with that part of us that gets excited about, about how we look at the world differently. And so I'm excited to see where that comes and, and what happens when we move forward with those next conversations. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now be talking to our very last, last panelist to answer these specific questions, which is Hannah. So you are the project coordinator for the Couch and Green Communities Resiliency Project. So could you just speak to what is the Resiliency Project and how does it support native pollinators? Sure, yeah. I'm just hearing my um, crowd of rowdy ducks out here, so sorry if they're... <laughs> in the background. Um, yeah, so the Resiliency Project is actually, it started last year as just a small um, COVID related um, grant from the city of Duncan. Um, and the focus of the, the grant was really on building community resilience. And um, through, and it was a community led initiative. So really like the idea for creating pollinator meadows um, as like a focus of the work really developed through community conversations. And really what we um, came to understand through our conversations and our meetings was that, you know, there is no such thing as community resilience if we're not also looking at ecological resilience. Um, you know, same thing with our food systems there. We really, we can work all we want on creating a localized resilient food system, but if we're not thinking about pollinator health and that's not integrated into that vision, then it really isn't, um, you know, a meaningful approach. Um, so yeah, the, the the meadows that we planted in the fall, we planted them last fall in Rotary Park, um, which is sort of adjacent to, kind of connected to McAdam Park, um, which people often know, know more. Um, and with an awesome group of volunteers and in collaboration with the Cowichan Valley Naturalists and um, Saanich Native Plants, we planted a three sections of, of meadow. Um, and so there's over 45 different species that we've planted in there. And um, yeah, it was just a really super educational, um, beautiful experience for me. Um, and I kind of have a background as a community organizer um, and an artist, and um, I'm really interested in in how to use sort of engaging community spaces to deepen our conversation around 
our relationships to the earth. Um, I personally believe that there will be no meaningful, tangible change um, unless our relationship to the earth changes. And for me, um, beginning to understand the relationships, for example, between um, native plants and um, native insects and the co-evolution between the plants and the insects, um, beginning to understand, uh, you know, for example, caterpillars that, that most butterfly species can only lay their eggs on one or two or native species. Without those species in the environment, those, those caterpillars don't have food. Those butterflies cannot live in that local area. And so I think that it's just really, it's a powerful thing to start to understand those relationships. Um, and I also believe that just in the times that we're moving into, that it's important that we break down this idea of, of restoration is something that ecologists do and they do that. And then we all do the rest of the stuff. I feel like it's really, really important to engage with the community. And I am not a restoration ecologist, but I have because there's been so much work done, because the science is so clear, because we have access to these native plants and these native seeds, and because there's so many great experts and resources, this is something that we can really take on as a community. And the only way that we will be able to mitigate localized biodiversity loss and really have an impact on a local level in, in addressing climate change I feel like the only way is if we all get on board and, you know, Michelle, that the vision of, you know, boulevards planted with native flowers um, and just like transforming the way that we landscape to me is just a really beautiful um, vision. So, so with the, with the resiliency project, what we're focused on now is, is planting a series of meadows this fall and then continuing with um, doing education in the community. Um, and yeah, we have an upcoming, actually next week. So pollinator week is June 21st to 27th. And so we have a series of workshops that we've just released, um, focused on native plants and native bees. And um, another thing that I'm quite interested in is using invasive species um, in like fiber arts and creative, um, like all kinds of creative uses. And so one of the workshops for Pollinator Week, we're, we're going into Samanos Marsh um, and harvesting the invasive yellow flag iris. And it's so amazing because this plant, you can use the leaves for, for basket making. You can use the leaves to create cordage, to create rope. The, the roots you can use for a brown dye and then the flowers you can use for a yellow dye. And so it's this totally beautiful, you know, set of, of creative uses that you can that you can get from this plant while also harvesting, um, you know, and removing this plant from an ecosystem where it doesn't belong. Um, so yeah, so in the resiliency project sort of just finding ways to creatively engage and, and and explore our relationship to the rest of the ecosystem. Thank you, Hannah. Um, what are your hopes and dreams for your work with the expansion of pollinator habitats in the Cowichan Valley? And what do you think it will take to take them, to make them come into reality? Hmm. Yeah, um, like some of that, I feel like I just spoke to, but um, really, um, so, so Douglas Tallamy, who I'm sure like some of you are familiar with, he's an entomologist who recently wrote a book called Nature's Best Hope. Um, and it really breaks down this vision of, um, he calls it the homegrown national park. So if, you know, say 50% of us humans were to look at our backyards and to see them in a new light and to start removing the invasive species planting native species in their place, digging up portions of our lawn, putting in um, different species and just sort of beginning this rewilding process, the amount of land that that would cover um, would have just dramatic effects on, on biodiversity loss. And I really feel that vision. I really feel like um, 
there's just so much there that's inspiring and nourishing and um and doable you know and and uh i mean there's a so i guess my vision would be to to really take that it's called telemese directive um to really take that and and you know introduce it again and again to the couch and valley and just in, encourage the community to take this on um and so part of what we are working on is building um a native seed bank so that is located at the garden education center and those seeds are entirely accessible to the community um, and it's small right now but we're working on you know more seed saving gatherings as we go into the fall and really building that local resource and then the other thing is called the um the native plant nursery program and so in that program, which Nicole, Nicole was mentioning that the students got some seeds from the resiliency project. So what we're doing is distributing particular species of seeds and encouraging people to grow them out in small nurseries in their backyards. And the idea is that half of those plants return to the project to be planted in the community meadow, um, you know, with the intention of deepening our stewardship of these collective meadow spaces. And then the other half of the plants participants are encouraged to dig up their lawn and plant them there instead. And um, it's just like an exciting way to sort of introduce these plants. So yeah, and in, in, in you know thinking about all the all of the lawn space that exists in the city of Duncan, um, and really visioning like what what would that look like if we were to, you know, over the next ten years. Um, you know, to really, to really approach that season by season and just increase the amount of, of habitat and biodiversity. Um, I think that it would be a really beautiful expression of community care and there would be so much in all of those interactions in all of those community gatherings and, you know, and planting together and like there's so much um, um emotional health and community health and well-being that come from those kind of spaces so yeah okay thank you so much um at this point we would like to offer our audience members an opportunity to ask questions if you have a question please feel free to type your question in the chat below like the chat box sorry not <laughs> And as these questions come in, I know that we already had a question from Sandy. So um, if any of the panelists would like to speak to that, that'd be great. Um, her question was, could you touch on native plants and their pollinators versus non-native plants and their pollinators? Uh, so if anyone would like to speak to that, that'd be- Yeah, I can. I can. I'm not sure I understand 100% the questions, but the question, but I can try. Um, so yeah, I mean, native plants, um have their own pollinator the native pollinators and a lot of our food our crop require the help of the honeybee as you know as a pollinator um so you have that specificity some pollinators actually uh, pollinate only one type of flower it's it is called oligolectic um also you have some native pollinators that just uh pollinate two or three, so monolectic, and the honeybee, on the contrary, pollinates a whole bunch of plants. Um, and some native pollinators do the same as the honeybee, so there's uh, all the different options, like the bumblebee. The bumblebee is really everywhere around. This is, I'm sure you, you've seen that, that bee everywhere, and, and so it's a polylectic. Um, however, there's been a, a lot of studies showing that even honeybees actually prefer the native plants and um there's been the research showed that surprisingly they kind of like uh older native plants that has have been in sites for a longer time so one option one possibility is that the plants are just healthier um and the bees are attracted by those plants we don't know also we can understand that with all we put on the plants we eat you know, all the pesticide and all the whatever, fertilizer, chemicals, and um, you can, I mean, I can easily understand that the bees are more attracted by native plants that have been just, you know, non-treated and that grow like weed. Um, so that's another option. Uh, but yeah, you have a cross, like cross things happening. The bees, the honeybees on native plants, some native pollinators on exotic plants, 
uh, but um, but yeah, it's really important. And then thank you, Hannah, for mentioning that again and again. But it's uh, I do work with honeybees, but um, as a biologist myself, as a mother myself, uh, the native native pollinators are the number one priority. Um, what I like about honeybees the most in my project, and this is why I developed it, it's because it has a very, the honeybee has a very special way um, to get people together. And it's, it's a, the best hook you can have for kids. Um, it, it just triggers naturally this excitement, this passion. Yes, it has a lot to do with the honey, I don't focus on the honey. We don't collect honey in our project because it's education uh, only. But um, but you need a hook if you want to engage that youth, if you want to be, get people excited, if you want people to listen to you when you have that big conversation to start about those dramatic things and the, the planet becoming. I mean, all those things that are very heavy. You need a hook. You need something that get people excited. And I found myself that the honeybee is an amazing hook. So people get interested. Oh, there's something as such a thing as pollinators. And then you can get deeper into the subject, into insect in general, and how important it is to actually help the native pollinators. But yeah, so I don't know if I answered your question, but not native plants are the priority. Native pollinators are the priority, I think, if we all want to be in a healthier, on a healthier planet. Awesome, thank you. Um, I see we have another question. You just add something to that too. Yeah, um, just um, I think that, oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you cut out for a second. Do you wanna? Can you hear me? Yes, all good now. Yeah, okay, my internet's a little bit unstable out here on my porch in my hammock. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add one thing about the native plants because um, one thing in thinking about creating habitat for native pollinators and, and something that I, I don't know if everyone's aware of, but, but one of the things is to um, create large patches of a single species it's a really uh, like in part of the pollination, the way that the bees pollinate, every time they come up to a new flower, it's almost like there's a little lock that they that they open, like each flower structure is a little bit different. Um, so thinking about large patches of, you know, goldenrod and then a large patch of asters just to provide as, as a, a most accessible um, pollen source, food source for the Awesome, thank you um, for adding that on. That's really interesting. Um, we are probably going to wrap up pretty soon, but there was one more question that was in the chat um, from Christopher just about um, how we came, became a B school. So if um, Katia or uh, Ms. Russo, if you'd like to quickly speak to that, that would be fantastic. Katia, do you want to speak to that? Sure, Ms. Russo. I know how you love to make us do things ourselves. Um, yeah, so there's a little bit of an application process for becoming a B school and becoming a B city. Um, both those designations are offered by um, an organization called, oh, geez, is it B Cities Canada or B Schools Canada? Which one? B City. Okay, just making sure. Um, and so they offer both of the designations and they have a website. You can go check out that process if that's something that you're interested in sharing out to your networks to have people pursue in their own communities. It's super cool. Um, there are actually not too many uh, B schools or B cities in British Columbia. Um, hence uh, Duncan hopefully being a uh, the first city on Vancouver Island to become a B city and why uh, QMS is going to be the second, is, is the second, sorry, start, uh, got used to using the past tense language, uh, is the second B school on Vancouver Island beaten out only by uh, John Barsby in Nanaimo. 
Um, and so there's an application process. You go on the website. It's a little bit different for city versus school, but for the school, we had this form and we had to go through uh, answering some questions about three key points, really. How are we going to protect pollinators as a school? How are we going to celebrate pollinators as a school? And how are we going to educate about pollinators, um, both within our school and also creating connections with the wider community, which I think we've done a super job of because we have stimulated the city of Duncan to pursue this process as well. Um, and so the application form is pretty simple, just filling out those questions, understanding that that education, celebration, and protection, those are commitments that we have to make. Uh, every year you renew uh, your designation, making sure that you're continually um, committing to this renewal of those three key points and that the school community is excited about that as well, making sure we're pushing those initiatives forward. Um, and so in our uh, application, we had to detail the things that we were doing to protect, educate, and celebrate about pollinators, um, which included a lot of things mentioned in the webinar, uh, painting a bee mural on our uh, school greenhouse, planting pollinator plants, creating a little pollinator garden at our school, uh, creating fun activities to engage people of all ages who go to QMS around pollinators, et cetera, et cetera. So they wanna really see that you're committed to doing those three things and getting other people excited about it too, whether that's just within the school community or also spreading far and wide across our other communities, because we, of course, have so many connections to those as well. Great. Um, I think we will now begin to wrap up as the clock ticks away. Thank you all for your uh, great responses. And thank you, Katia, for um, going over what we've uh, been doing to become a B-School. So to our panelists, thank you so much for your participation and thank you to everyone else here for coming. This evening has really been a special way to commemorate the important work being done in the Cowichan Valley to celebrate pollinators. Uh, as you know, this webinar has been recorded and will soon be posted on the Queen Margaret School YouTube channel. Once it is, please feel free to rewatch it and share it with your friends and family. So I've sent a link to the QMS YouTube channel in the chat where the webinar will be uploaded. Thank you again to everyone for attending and to the panelists for your insightful answers and all the work you do in the community. Panelists and guests alike, you can now go ahead and leave the Zoom call. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, our host. Can we stay on a moment just to debrief? Sounds good. <laughs>